be for 50 years. That's pretty amazing. Uh, and it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of people that, that want to see God do something. Uh, that's all we've wanted to do for these years we've been here in Germany and the opportunities we've had to work with people and, and see God do something. We just want to see God do something. Amen. My whole, my whole life is, is, I guess, is wrapped up in one little phrase that I repeat over and over again. Look what God can do. Amen. And that's what it's all about. Uh, we think of missions and we think of, well, that's something somebody else does. But it's not true. You've been here, and I'm sure, because I've known Brother Woody, Brother T for many years, that uh, you're part of this missions process. And it's not just sending people to go someplace to do something. It's to serve God right where you're at. You know, missions is two part. We got people that God does in fact send to go places that they're not used to living in. They're different countries, some different languages, all that kind of stuff. But he also, the other part of missions is leaving those people behind to do two things, to support those missionaries that you send on the field and to reach those people there. When you look at the book of Acts, uh, chapter 13, you find where the, some of the first missionaries were sent from the local church out into the missions field. That church was busy serving, and those missionaries were busy serving. Do you think that church was excited about seeing Paul and his compadres go out into the mission field? Well, in one sense, yeah, because everybody likes to see the will of God in people's lives and God doing things, so we can say, look what God can do. But, you know, on the other side of that coin is Paul and his people that went with him, that they can know that the church is still back there doing the job there. They weren't uh, all over the world, known world at that time, starting churches and reaching people. At the same time, the churches there that had sent them were staying faithful to reach people there. And if, if one is not doing the other, then it's not total missions. It's got to be all together. Now, I don't know what uh, uh, Paul, or Paul, uh, uh, Brother, uh, tell me his name, Woody and, and uh, Teague uh, preached on, but we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. They may have gone there. I'm sure I'm not going to say anything new that they haven't said. Uh, but uh, we're going to just go over some things and see what the God has for us. By the time we get done with today, I want to, if you don't learn anything else, if you don't get fired up about anything else, I want to really emphasize the number one main purpose and main person in missions. Number one. And we'll talk about it as we go. So let's pray, and then we'll read it and then get into it. Father, we love you. Thank you for bringing us together in this great church, and thank you for the many years of testimony they have of being here. But now these people are here now, and I pray, God, that you'd work on this church, not only to reach others through their missionaries abroad, but right here in this community, that they could see you do many great things in the hearts and lives of people, to see people saved and grown more. And I pray you'd use these War Room Wednesdays to help encourage these folks to just keep doing what they could do right here. And we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, starting at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, for the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now, just a little pause. And again, if I'm repeating something you've already heard, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it anyway. These churches <laughs> of Macedonia were some of the most uh, worse off people of that time. They've gone up through all kinds of persecution, all kinds of trials and difficulties. Uh, because of the church get going and their stand for Christ after they got saved, they were persecuted by all kinds of people, the Romans and the Jews. So many, we know from the book of Acts, that many were scattered abroad because of persecution. But God used that to get the gospel out to many places. Now the person that is being written to about the churches of Macedonia is the church at Corinth. The churches at Corinth on a whole were doing great. They were the big churches. They were the well-financed churches. They were the churches that had everything financially and physically you could imagine. They were the best off of that time. So we have a contrast here. We got the churches of Macedonia not doing so good financially, physically. And we got the churches at Corinth that were doing great. They're doing great. So let's read that again. We'll start in verse 1 and keep it that in mind. Moreover, brethren, we do to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Wait, the grace of God to these churches that are going through a tough time? Yeah. How they in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. 
Now you'll find as you study these churches that they not only gave, and by the way, what was happening here is there's being an offering collected for the people that are bad off in the, in the Jerusalem area. Uh, and we through these processes, we take a great example of, of our faith promise missionary missions today. But they were going to go through a tough time. They were the ones that you would think would complain, but they didn't. It says they abounded in the riches of their liberality. Their joy was full. For to their power, I bear a record, yea, beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Look, if this church is to be a success, if missions here in this community, as you reach this community, and abroad as you support missionaries someplace else, is going to be a success, it's got to take people who are willing to give themselves to God to do what God wants them to do. That's what it takes. By the way, I believe missions is an essential part of a church. Churches that don't emphasize missions, they die. Now, they might have a lot of people going to them. They might have uh, masses of things they do in different programs, but spiritually, they're amazingly weak because they're not reaching out to reach the gospel, get the gospel to as many as they can. Verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. Now, this is not normal mission pra missionary practice in our world today. In our world today, a missionary like me and others that you may know, they'll go from church to church to church to church, telling people, we call it, back in my day it was called deputation, nowadays a lot of times they call it pre-fuel ministry, they got a lot of names for it, but basically the missionary, missionary families, are going from church to church to church, to tell them their burden for where God wants to send them with the prayer that they can connect with that church, not only prayerfully, which is important, but also financially, which is important. And they try to connect. And through that, the missionary will start gaining support, prayer support, financial support, where they're gaining enough where they can live on the field where they're going. But that's not what happened here. They, they were tell, asking, could we please give you an offering? It wasn't the missionary coming to them and saying, hey, we want to do all this, and hey, that's great, let's do it. They were saying, would you please take our offering? Now, I've been a missionary for many, many years, and I don't know if I've ever got that before. I praise God for all the churches that reach out sacrificially and by faith to support us, but I'm not sure if they ever went out of the way to write me a letter and say, hey, would you take our money? Come on. Doesn't always happen that way. It doesn't always happen that way. The average, average uh, time on missions, and it, it varies about what field they're going to and a lot of different things, but the average stay of a missionary family on deputation to raise support is about four years. So for four years, they're going around the country or wherever they can go to try to raise support. Four years. Now, that's a great training ground for those missionaries. It's not a mistake that they do it. There's a lot of good things that can happen. There's a lot of faith building that can happen through that. Uh, but four years that they should be on the mission trip. When I, we were first, uh, we knew that God wanted us to be missionaries, but in our last church up in Watertown, New York, which is still our sending church, Watertown Baptist Temple, when we were we there, started the process of getting prepared to get all that together so we'd get back here to Germany and be missionaries. And it was amazing as uh, we first went with some mission boards in the area that we know, we talked to them and said, okay, well, you need to have four-year Bible degree. They need to have at least two years of seminary. And then you need to go through all this different stuff. And I said, wait, I'm 40 years old. By the time I do all this, I'll already be retired. Give me a break. We've got to do something different. Praise the Lord. We were able to work out different. God worked it out different for us. Mission agencies are great. There's a reason for them. So is sending churches. It's all a way God does to get people there. But wait a minute. Are we thinking outside the box yet? Remember, anytime you think out the box, outside the box, it's about what God can do. Do you, do you really believe God can do amazing things right here in this Simbach area? Amen. I believe it. And he's demonstrated it somewhat for 50 years, but you haven't been here 50 years ago. You're here now. Can God still do it today? Amen. We first started at Homefells Baptist Church. We started actually... Uh, Preparing for that a couple a couple of months before uh, the first Sunday in January, we, that's when we had our first official church service. 
when we had our first official church service in January 2000, with you, if you remember back, that was the first Sunday after Y2K. You remember? Mm -hmm. And everybody told me, what are you nuts? What are you going to go over there and start a church in Y2K? What happens if the Lord comes back? I said, well, if he comes back, he comes back. But we're going to be starting a church when he does. It's that simple. And I, wonder, I, I never could imagine what was the controversy here? What was the problem? We're just serving God. And God can do whatever he wants to do. He, he's God. And right. we didn't do it. So then uh, we, we started uh, the church and got going. In April, we, we chartered the church. In May, the next May, April, and in May, come if you know your calendar, May, we decided to have our very first missions conference. And once again, all my preacher buddies said, you're nuts. It's too early. You only got 19 people coming to your church. Don't do it. You'll destroy the church. It's just financially ruin the whole thing. I said, but we prayed about it. We all, not only just me, but the whole church believes this is what we need to do. So we did it. We prayed that we could take on two missionaries for $50 a month, our very two missionaries. We prayed the whole church. We took weeks and weeks praying for them. Our very first missions conference was over. We took on six missionaries for $100 ah. each. Woo! See, that's what God can do. Amen. There's going to be the naysayers out there. They're going to be the people say you can't do it. But we look at people like the churches of Macedonia, we find out, yeah, God can do it. Then we come to Simbach or Ansbach or Hohenfels or wherever it is that God might want a church to be, and we see God can do it there. Amen. God can do it. Look what God can do. And again, that's our thing. So verse 4 again, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon, the fellow, take upon us the fellowship of the ministry of the saints. And this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. If I took a poll tonight, I'm sure I'd get every hand up that would say, do you love Jesus? And everybody would say, well, sure, preacher, we're in church. We love Jesus. Do you love Jesus enough to serve Jesus? Come on. Because when we look at missions and mission programs, sometimes we forget about Jesus being involved and we want to do all this stuff. We've been in many churches through the years, and there's a lot of gracious, kind churches, and a missionary shows up, and they really take care of the missionary. They give them a large love offering. What? Sorry. <laughs> Just kidding, for John Kerry. But and they, they want to really be a blessing. And that's great. I mean, fine. I always felt very insecure with that. It's not about me, people, do we not? And they want to do all kinds of programs and come up with all kinds of stuff, but they forget. Uh oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. The number one person in missions is okay, we'll talk about that. Come on. Therefore, as they abound in everything. What they abound in? In faith. Who's this? The churches of Macedonia. Who are the most persecuted church of the time. You're not going to find too many churches in our world today that's worse off than they were. There are some out there. There are some churches that are being terribly persecuted in our world today. Today. Come on. In faith. In utterance. What does that mean? That means they were willing not only to support Paul and the missions, ideas, and opportunities God was giving him, but they were able to, right there to speak and to, to, to re reach as many people as they could in their own area. And knowledge and in diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. Oh man, when a, when a people, when a church really get the idea of missions and what it is, that's when the church gets to say, look what God can do. Look what God can do. God can do it. Even with a small group of people, you look around and say, well, we're just a handful of people. We're not many people. God can do it. Amen. I could tell you story after story about what God's done in our ministry. And they're amazing stories. And people look at me, it's like, you're crazy. Not me. I'm just trying to do... Look, when I first... I, I was a, in the Army for... 21 years, I was a first sergeant for a bunch of that, for five last five years. I thought I had it together. I thought I had it down. I, I'm not afraid of nothing. There's, there's no man, woman, boy, or girl that I'm afraid of. I can stand and do anything until I became a passive church, and then I just crumbled. And I realized very quickly that any kind of confidence and talent I thought I had was completely out the window dealing with 
people and what God wanted us to do. Amen. Come on. I spent hours, the first few months, and even for the first couple of years. Honefells is a farming community, a lot of open air, not a very big place as far as a town. And I spent hours walking in the fields and praying. And I can remember my pretty much my number one prayer was, God, are you, do you really know what you're doing here? I'm the wrong guy for this job. I'm not it. I don't have the ability or talent to do it. It's got to be you. You know what I found out? It was. It was him. Come on. It wasn't me. I didn't have any kind of thing. And, you know, getting prepared and having programs and being organized, nothing wrong with that. As long as we don't take out of our imagination that it's God that's got to do it. He's got to do it in your heart. He's got to do it in the heart of the preacher and can, together in the heart of the church. And when God does that, you'll be able to see all kinds of amazing things. Amen. Amen. We, we started the church in our living room. We had a... There was a I'd be happy to. We started that in our living room. You told me to say it, so I did. And, uh, I do what I'm told. Good, good soldier, good husband. I've been married almost 40, 43 years. I know how to say yes, dear. So, I do. so whatever I'm saying. So we, we started it in a, in a living room. It was a two, two apartment building. We lived on the top downstairs. And we started to grow. And pretty soon we were running that out. It, the, the living room was had the chairs in it. It was the auditorium. The, the bedrooms became Sunday school classes. The kitchen during the services was a nursery. And after the services, we cleaned up the diapers and it became the fellowship hall. And you can imagine the meals we had in there, but that's okay. <laughs> and it started to grow and, and grow. And man, look what God's doing here. Now what do we do? Of course, they all look at, you know, what you going to do now, preacher? No clue. <laughs> so we began to pray. And lo and behold, the people downstairs from us were military. They PCS, they left. So the bottom apartment's done. So I talked to my buddies again. Multitude comes through there's wisdom. Okay, I believe that. The Bible teaches that. It's true. But they don't always give you good advice. I said, look, we, what I want to do is we want to rent the downstairs apartment. We'll stay upstairs and rent the downstairs apart for the church. But what we need to do, because we're going so good, we need to take the wall out, which would be between the living room and the master bedroom. And we need to take so we have a big enough auditorium space to fit the people that's coming. And then we would have two fellowship halls, one upstairs and one downstairs. It was kind of cool. So all my buddies said, no, don't do that. Don't do it. Don't. It, there, there's no way a landlord's going to let you take out a wall. and They're just not going to happen. So me being the person that would rather listen to the Lord and what he's leading, I went and talked to the landlord. Long story short, the landlord paid to bring the architect back that designed the house, and they did tests to make sure that the wall could come out safely, you know, it might, that it wasn't a load-bearing wall. And I, and I would have never thought of that. I would have just taken the thing out. I'm army. Destroy. I would have been happy to do that. So he, he not only did that, the landlord took out the wall. He paid for it. He took it away, did it all. Uh, he we just had to do some touch-up painting, and I put better lighting in the ceiling. That's all we did. That's what God can do. Amen. Come on. Then in about uh, six months, going to a year, the church is still pretty young. We're all growing that. Now the neighbors are starting to complain. It's just a residential area, so cars are parked everywhere. I could remind me over coffee sometime to tell you about the crazy next-door neighbor. Rose is laughing. The crazy next-door neighbor lady. She was 80 or 90 years old. She was old. And she knew every cuss word in English. She didn't speak any other English except cuss words. And she would come in the morning and yell at us through the windows and bang on the door and cuss at us and, and because we were parking in front of her parking lot and all this stuff. And her husband might have needed to go to the hospital and on and on it would go. Uh, her husband was dead for five years by then, but that's okay. Maybe they still needed to pick him up. I don't know. And it was just crazy. And the people and the, na the other neighbors... They weren't as vocal, but they were, you know, a little loud, you know, kids running and people talking. And Americans, they don't ever do anything quiet. It's always loud. Amen. And they were, yeah, it's true, isn't it? It is. Us Americans. I tell you, we should be ashamed. We're not. And, and uh, so I, I, we said, well, church, we need to pray. We have, well, what are you going to do, preacher? No clue. I have no idea. I'm going to pray and see what God's got in mind. And, we had a family that drove a little ways. They lived in a little town. And they drove by this big old school building. It was abandoned. It was kind of used, but it was 
rough and overgrown trees and everything. He said there was this huge building turned out to be an old school building. Why don't we see if we can rent that? Sure. Yeah, sure. That's going to work. You know, we were paying uh, uh, about a thousand Deutschmarks at the time. That was before the euro. And that was about 500 bucks a month for our rent where the church was then. And I knew, because I was the one that worked with the other people with the books, I knew we could afford $500 a month. But we couldn't afford $600. Couldn't have done it. Couldn't have done it. Lord was meeting our needs for right where we're at now. But we began to pray. Long story short, about six months later, well, four months later, we were moving into that building. And the meeting that we had, and it was a long, drawn-out thing, because the government owned that building, so it was messing with the city government. And yeah, oh, it, was, it was amazing. More coffee, we'll tell you the stories. But we were at the meeting for the, for the rent, and our people had been praying every service, Bible studies, we took extra time during prayer time to pray about, you know, Lord, what do you, would you work this out? So we had three things we wanted to see God do. Wanted to give us the rent at the same rent we were paying, 1,000 Deutschmark. We wanted a long-term contract. So if they could keep the rent at that one, we didn't want to have that for one year and now they want to triple the rent. And we wanted them, there's always rumors, I don't know about here, but where I was, there's always rumors about bases, clothing, and all that. It's still going on in Ansbach all the time. So I wanted a military clause in the contract. If the military left, that we wouldn't be held to the, to the contract for the building. So we go to the first meeting, and I had a good friend of mine, Jim White. I think this church supports me, at least I used to. Um, uh, they're with me translating, and I can understand German, but, you know, he was helping. So the mayor stands up after the little preliminaries and said, okay, well, I guess we need to talk about the contract and the rent. Because up to then, they never talked about rent or cost or anything. And he gets, like, literally like this, wringing his hands. Would, would a thousand marks be too much? So I hear this, and I'm about to go crazy inside, and Jim, and I stay cool. Jim translates it for me. I believe we can afford that. <laughs> He said, oh, by the way, I don't know if you'll agree to it or not. We want to do two other things. And you know it's coming, right? Uh, we want to do a long-term lease. And we want to put a military clause in the contract in case the military closes, you're not held to the contract. Mm -hmm. Exactly everything we prayed for. Look what God can do. <laughs> Woo! Amen. And I could go on and on. And even now in Ansbach, God's doing amazing things. Look what God can do. See, it comes with an attitude of people are saying they're willing to give themselves to do what God wants to do in their area and around the world for missions. It takes a group of people who want to do that. I remember we, uh, we were start, wanted to start a German work, and our first one, in fact. And we had, we had gone to, to language school with some missionaries, uh, Gary and Frankie Lillard. They're not on the field anymore. He's got a lot of health problems. And they, we had known them from language school, and they would come down to home fails every now and then as they were finished with language school, but they're really trying to search where God wanted to be in Germany. And But we were praying, and I, we had led the church to pray about our church, and the church was only three years old, starting a German work, because there was none close by. The closest German work was in Regensburg, and that was iffy. They had a lot of problems with the gospel and stuff like that. So a long stretch of people, a lot of in between, with no good church in Germany. So Gary and Frankie came one Sunday evening, their evening service, and they're sitting right in the front row, and uh, we said, okay, so let's pray uh, for what we've been praying for starting this year church. Dude sitting over here shoots up his hand and said, Pastor, can I pray for that tonight? Sure, brother, go ahead. He throws himself on the ground. We've just been teaching about being prostrate before the Lord. Not like that, but that's what we talked about. We told people what that meant. And he threw himself on the floor and started to pray, Oh God, put it on the hearts of Gary and Frankie Littlewood to come here and help us start this church. They're looking for a place to serve. And Gary and Frankie are sitting over here. And they're looking at me like, you put him up in that, didn't you? I don't know how to get him up, but he's praying. <laughs> and they came and helped start that church. Amen. Look what God can do. And you know what that did to the people in the church? As they saw their prayers being answered, mm -hmm. they gave of themselves. Mm -hmm. And they prayed, and they were willing to sacrifice to do whatever 
God asked them to do. And they did. They helped pass out flyers. They cursed Cain financially. They did all this stuff to make this stuff happen. And look what God can do. And God is still in that business today. We must be willing to give of ourselves and whatever God would ask us to do. No, God's not going to ask all of us to go to a foreign country and, and preach the gospel and start churches. He may just call many of us to stay right where that be as faithful as we can be right here. Amen. To support what's going on in here. Get behind your pastor and support him with outreach programs or whatever he's got on his mind. And I don't know him that well, but he looks kind of crazy to me. So I would, <laughs> I'd be careful about, the, you know, to pay attention. If he says something, I would do it. I'm just saying. <laughs> he's a former Marine, too. Yeah, that, too. I, was, I, I noticed there's no red crayons up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where's Logan at when you need him, right? We, we, got we have some... a Marine in our church. In fact, he's our assistant pastor, and we know all what we need to know about red crayons. We know all about it. <laughs> hey. You know, there's, the thing about missions is we, we often think they about our walls. Marines eat red crayons. And by the way, it's part of it. Yep. It's part of it. But they're willing to give. But that's not all of it. Are you willing to give your time, whatever talents you might have, your abilities, or just your, hey, I can learn. That's a good attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the biggest things that scares me when a, when a Christian says to me, you know, might be being a little personal tonight. When a Christian comes up to me, somebody has a testimony of knowing Jesus as their personal Savior, comes up to me and says, Something like, well, pastor, I would do that, but I just can't. Don't say that to me. My heart just goes, oh. You can tell me you're afraid. You can tell me you're unsure. You can tell me you have no clue how to do it. But when you tell me you can't, you know what I hear? I won't. And Christians should never tell God I won't. Right. Ever. You can tell God, I'm, that scares me to death. I've been there. I'm scared to death most times I get up before the pulpit. Somebody asked me, some kid the other day asked me, uh, do you get nervous when you preach? Every time. Mm -hmm. From that seat to here is terrifying to me. And I have to rely on God to do what he wants to do in and through me. Amen. Tell, tell God you can't. Tell him you're afraid. He can work with that. Tell him you're, you're unclear and uncertain. He can work with that. Tell, tell him you just don't have a clue. He can work with that. Tell him you won't. God's not working with that. He'll never bless that. He'll never, ever bless that in any area of your life. And I'm not just talking about the church and missions and all that. I'm talking about any growth area in your Christian walk. You could tell God you can't. He's not taking that excuse. He's not. And he will not bless it. I guarantee it. Take this old man's advice. He will not bless it. But you say with an open, honest heart, God, here am, I, here am I, send me, as Isaiah did. He will. And he'll help you. And he'll guide you. And he'll give you what you need. Pretty soon, you'll be able to look back a few weeks, few months, maybe a few years later, look back and see, look what God did. That's right. And that's what we're supposed to see. Mm -hmm. That's what you're supposed to see. You know, there's giving in the Bible. And when you're talking, I think it, it's the same principle whether you're talking about tithing and for money or your talents or abilities or any of that. There's four types of uh, giving I find in the Bible. Four types. Number one is giving below the tithe. Book of Malachi and other places talk about that. Uh, what does the Bible call that? It calls you a thief. If you're not tithing what God has given you, and by the way, it's even been exaggerated in the New Testament, so we're supposed to give as God prospers us. So that goes even beyond the tithe sometimes. We're, but if you don't, that's number one. If you don't tithe, you're thief and robber. Number two, the tithe. Tithe means tenth. It's a tenth percent of those things God gives you. And find, in our day and age, we mainly work in cash. You know, money, we all get paid. We get paychecks. Back then, they worked in cattle and all that. Even some people, farmers, they work in those types of things. But the tithe is amazing. Again, there's many places in the Bible that teach that. I'm not going to teach about tithing and all that tonight. But your pastor can do that as he sees fit. But the tithe, when you think about it, 
comes right back to the church. When you and I tithe in our, in our churches, that money goes right back to the church. It pays the lights, it pays the heat, and praise God, it's warm in here. Sometimes it even pays for the chili, praise God. God usually brings it right back for us. Enjoying these beautiful chairs, the comfort of where we're at, the beautiful stuff God has given you, and that you're using for the Lord, that's your tithe. God brings it right back. Then the third type of giving, again, we find this in Old Testament, even in the New Testament, is offerings, special offerings. Now, special offerings that we find in the Bible, uh, we see it a lot when they needed to repair the temple. They would put a box out, drill a hole, people would bring money, and, and they would bring a special offering to do a specific thing. We still do that today. There might be a special offering you want to take for some individual in the community that's going through our time, pay the rent or whatever you need to do, to buy a, a piece of equipment at the church, you take a special offering, you do something like that. But again, that all comes back to the church. Even the people who help in your own community, if it's helping the church, it comes right back. Fourth thing we find is faith promise giving. Faith God promise giving, again, not only financially, but time and talents, is the way God uses for the church to go beyond themselves. When we give the faith promise missions, it doesn't stay here. Yeah, sure, you might use part of that to help a missionary that comes here, but still, that missionary is leaving, so it's leaving beyond the church. Faith promise missions is that thing that God has given the church to reach beyond itself, to go do what he's commanded the church to do, and that's to reach every creature with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith promise missions. Whatever you call it. Some churches call it grace promise, uh, grace giving and those types of things. Same thing, same concept, but it's used to reach beyond ourselves to fulfill that great commission or great command to reach the whole world with the gospel. By the way, that's finances, that's time, talent, abilities, and just, hey, God, whatever you want me to do. Amen. That's what that is. So that demonstrates why missions is so important for the church. We reach beyond ourselves. The church that doesn't think about missions isn't thinking beyond themselves. They will die spiritually. Because we're not fulfilling the Great Commission to go out into all the world. We have this. you got this Simba here, and that's yours. But God also tells you to reach the whole world. Amen. As your church does what they can as God leads you to reach the world, so is Ansbach Baptist Church and Holmfeld's Baptist Church and Rhineland Baptist Church and all. We're all doing the same thing, to be obedient to God, to reach God, reach beyond ourselves into places we can't go. But it doesn't eliminate also the responsibility for you. It's right here. These people that were so persecuted were willing to meet the needs of people beyond themselves as they had utterance and all those things to reach the people right where they're at. That's the amazing thing about, about missions. And that's where all these stories come in that I can tell. Because we get to see what God can do. Amen. And God can do amazing things. God can do amazing things. We learn about sowing when we do this. The principle about sowing. You should ask your preacher to preach on, pray about preaching on sowing and, and all those things. It's amazing to see how God works. I'll go through just some basic principles. First step in sowing is we reap what we sow. If you, if you sow corn in the ground, you can pretty much get corn back. You're not going to get tomato. So we reap the gospel. We can expect the results in the gospel. Okay? Then next, we reap more than we sow. You put it, one kernel of corn in the ground and you get a whole stock of it. With I used to know all the numbers, but I'm getting old. I can't remember. But there's a bajillion uh, ears of corn or whatever on the stock. Four years and 500 seeds. I don't remember what it is. But it's a whole bunch more than we did. So we can expect God to do exceedingly abundantly all that we can ask or think. Amen. We really can. And God really will do more than we think. Mm -hmm. Then last, uh, next we reap in proportion to what we sow. We sow enough for this half of the room. We can't expect anything over here. Just over here. So if this is where we sow, that's where we'll reap. Well, that's the missions. You sow and you do what you can here, and then you send the seed elsewhere through other people, and then you see a greater opportunity of harvest. And then lastly is the one I don't like. You reap after yourself. We can't start counting, counting converts to Christ before it actually happens. 
We have to get saved first. So we need to reap, or we need to sow before we can reap. It, it always takes work. I was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, the, the milk factory of the world, or whatever they call it, the cow factory. I don't know nothing about cows. <laughs> cows is what gives you milk, as long as they put it in a carton, and what you get steaks out of, as long as somebody else cuts them up for you. I don't know anything in between. I don't know nothing about cows. Not a thing about cows. I, I couldn't know anything about cows if you paid me. I don't really care. One time I worked on a, a, a dairy farm to help a farmer, and this was in New York. And you know what job I got. I got cleaning the stalls up, because that's all I was good for, cleaning the stalls. Man, I don't like cows. Long story. <laughs> but you've got to reap now to expect it later. It takes a lot of work. Dairy farmers work hard. Amen. Regular farmers work hard. It's hard. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Those dairy farmers, I learned again more in New York than I did in Wisconsin. He was up way before I was, and I got up early in the morning. And then he stayed up milking those cows in the morning, and every day you've got to mess with them cows in the morning. Oh, praise God, he made me a soldier, not a dairy farmer. <laughs> <laughs> It's just hard work, and it's not always pretty. No. Cleaning them stalls was not a whole lot of fun, but it had to be done. It took hard work. Sometimes we just got to get into it and stay at it. Dairy farmers and other farmers, for that matter, they don't get a day off. Mm -mm. They don't. Uh, they have to do all kinds of arranging with friends and other farmers to take care of their farm so they can go on a vacation or anything. If they don't get a day off. They gotta be at it every day. Can I tell you folks, we don't get a day off either. We don't get a day off from giving the gospel. Come on. God gives us opportunity and we should capitalize on those opportunities God gives us. Amen. And God doesn't set out a schedule when he's gonna give us opportunities besides those people he brings right in front of us. So there's opportunities to help. But all this starts with you gotta be willing of yourself. And it brings us back to the very first verse of our text and who the most important part of missions is. Let's go back. Let's read it together. I want you to see it. I want you just to get it. The first, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 1. And we'll just go through this very quickly and then I'll be done. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God. God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So we learned the churches of Macedonia were going through a hard time. The churches of Corinth are going, going through a good time. But God can still do stuff. It's all about Him. You want to say, be able to say at the end of your day, end of your week, look what God can do? You got to let God be God. And he'll lead you and guide you in your personal walk, in your church life, through your pastor, through those programs and things that he comes up with. Remember, he's a crazy guy, so you got to listen to him. <laughs> and God will work. And he'll use people just like you to do it. The amazing part of being in missions, and by the way, we're all in missions. Amen. The amazing part is that an almighty God, the creator of everything we know and understand, the universe and everything, it's not that. The, 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 the God that created everything and knows everything, I'm going to throw this thing away, you know what I mean? Embarrassing. And he's the God that can do it. Amen. Can do it. Amen. He's the God that can put us in a position where we're not going to say, I can't. Mm -hmm. But God, I don't know how. Mm -hmm. And help me to know your will. Help me to know how I can be a part and support my pastor and support my church to reach this community and the world for missions. God, use me. I'm not, I'm not anything great. I'm not anything amazing. But God, I want you to use me. Because you're God. And though you're amazing, and there's no way in the world you should use me, You've decided to use me. That's right. You know, God could have got the gospel out in all kinds of ways. He could have arranged the stars. And by the way, the creation does point to God. We all know that. The Bible teaches that. But he could have put John 3.16 in the stars. 
he could arrange this Kirk Germany would be a good place because there's clouds all the time and put John 3.16 in the clouds. And he could, he could say, go to church on Sunday in the clouds. God loves you in the clouds. But he's determined and decided to use you and me. Amen. And we're nobody special. Mm -hmm. If you get the point in your Christian life, you think you've arrived, you need to get on your knees because you haven't. God is still at work in your life every day of your life. He wants us, you and I, to be a part of the process that he is determined for. And he wants to be God. He wants it done his way. And in such a way that our lives and our ministries and with missions and all those things brings glory to God. Glory to him. Because he deserves it. He's God. And he's given us... Are you saved tonight? Amen. I, that's a miracle. Yeah. When we see God save somebody, even us, that's something only God can do. That's a miracle. And yet, God wants to use you and me anyway. Next time these thoughts come in your mind, I can't remember. That's not the right thing to say. God, I will. Amen. I remember we were young Christians, and I'll leave you with this story, and I'll be done. We had just started coming to uh, Osbach Baptist Church. It was Berean Baptist Church back then. And the pastor kept teaching on this thing called tithing. So Rose and I, we came home one day, and he said, you know, it's all in the Bible. He showed us every verse, all these verses he, he spent on. And my preacher back then, Travis Cumbess, our half message was, was small message. <laughs> this guy could preach forever. But he took us 90 Bible verses was his average on every every service. 90. Counted them. Man, that gets so hungry now. <laughs> so he started talking and teaching about tithing. So we went home and we, like they did in the church of Berea, we got in the scriptures and said, yeah, yeah, he's right. I can't argue with it. So we looked at our budget, which being young and dumb, we didn't have one. We didn't know what a budget was. But we knew we had a lot of debt. We knew we had maxed out every Kenner card every idiot company would ever give us. We maxed it out. We're deep in debt. But the Bible says to tithe, so we did. We started tithing. I, got a, I wish I could say it was out of joy, but it wasn't. It was, well, that's what the Bible says, so that's, joy came later. Come on. Yeah. The, the hilarious giving came later. But I'll be honest, that first it wasn't. Then it did seem it wasn't a couple months later and a missionary shows up and they start talking about this giving the mission stuff. I can't tithe and now you want me to give the missions? But he said, pray about it. Let God speak to your heart. And then do what God tells you to do. And, and just be as faithful at it as you can be. So Rose and I, we, we believed him. We got in our Bibles and said, yep. That crazy preacher up there is spitting and shouting, he's right. He's right, it's in here. So we began to give faith promise. One much. One much at all. Now since then, God has blessed and our giving's increased. What I give, none of your business. Come on. If you ask me afterwards, I'll tell you, because I'm an open book, but I never say it from the pulpit. I'll answer your questions. I'm an open book. I have no secrets. But I can tell you, I have not missed any meals. And you look at me now, and you say, yeah, he ain't missed too many meals. God has been faithful to us. Right. And that's the key. It's about God. What God can do. And one day we can all say, look what God can do. Amen. Thank you, folks. God love you. Amen. Well, the Lord keeps you humble. Sunday, Phil called me an idiot from the pulpit. <laughs> and tonight, this brother called me crazy from the pulpit. Amen. The Lord keeps you humble. That wasn't just an assumption. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. The uh, Just one thing he said, he's praying about faith promise. I'm not going to re-preach his sermon. Boy, it was very encouraging, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Just to see what God can do. 
And, you know, we've seen what God can do about three Sundays running uh, where we had 50 people to see a young lady get baptized, Amen. and then we had 30, and then we had 38, and uh, God, is I, 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 God is good. I have been uh, trying to put together uh, some, some stuff for a special service the first Sunday in March. I'm not going to tell you all about it, but I've kind of seen some history of the church over its 50 years. This church, where when I came in July, there were 10 people, basically, was running in the 400s, mm -hmm. in the 70s. Ran two or 300 in the 2000s. Sinners haven't changed. Mm -hmm. The Savior hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. You and I just got to see what God can do. Right. Along the faith promise idea, the Bible says in chapter 9, and by the way, no one's preached from that text, and you're totally different from anything. God, God, you, you preached what God gave you, and it built upon what they've said. Nothing was repeated, not one thing. N not any of your side texts. Nobody's mentioned any of those in these last few weeks. But in chapter 9, this is what I want you to, to, to not only go away with what he said, but just keep this in mind about the faith promise. You read the rest of chapter 8 and on into chapter 9, you see uh, the phrase, prove the sincerity of your love. In other words, we talk about loving Jesus, but show it. Mm -hmm. All right? Perform the doing of it. And you see that, so basically, you've been talking about doing it, bring it to pass. But here's what I want you to get. Chapter 9, verse 7. Every man... According as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, but as he mentioned, God loveth a cheerful giver. But when we look at that, it sounds kind of like, let every man, according as the man purposeth in the man's heart, give. But if you just watch my hands for a second, here's what I get from that verse. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart. And let's see what God can do. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for a very encouraging service.